You are listening to the second segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing, with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Susan Weed. Susan is an American herbalist and director of the Wise Women's Center located near Woodstock, New York. She is known for her writing and teaching of what she describes as the Wise Women Way of Herbalism. Susan is the author of five books and a contributor to the Routledge International Encyclopedia of Women's Studies and writes a regular column in Sage Woman and for Awakened Woman Online. You can learn more about Susan by visiting SusanWeed.com. Hello, Susan. Welcome back to Sky Blue Symposia. And tonight we're going to discuss the scientific tradition that you alluded to last week. I'm so glad to be back here. Thank you all for joining me again. Yes, last week we talked about the three traditions of healing. The scientific tradition, the heroic tradition, and the wise woman tradition. Now, if you are not driving a car, I would invite you to close your eyes for a moment and kind of look into that space behind your eyes and smooth it out there And now we're going to draw a line. And that line can be any color, but I suggest that it be gold or orange to you. And after you've drawn your line, I would like you to measure it. You will find that you have measuring devices there. Now, I need for you to make note of what you found the measurement to be, and then I would like you to measure your line again, please. And then make note of the second measurement as well. If we wanted to be quite thorough, we could measure once or twice more, but for our purposes, I think two times will suffice. Now, I want to ask you, were your two measurements exactly the same? Or were they slightly different? If they were exactly the same, then your line exists. And if they were different, then your line does not exist. And this, in a rather cartoonish way, is the essence of the scientific tradition, whose symbol is the line. The scientific tradition says to us, if I measure it more than once, and there is little or no deviation, then I know I am actually measuring something which exists in the real world. And if I measure it repeatedly and I always get different answers, then I know I am not measuring something that exists in the real world, but something that is simply my imagination or a figment of my mind. The scientific tradition says of itself that it is reductionistic. In other words, the scientific tradition seeks to find the smallest active principle. How does this work when it comes to herbs and herbal medicine? Well, I often say that there is an arc of herbalism. And that arc on one side begins with naked people rolling in the living plants. And arcs across, and at the other end, uh, comes to a white-coated lab technician synthesizing a molecule that was first extracted from a plant. It's all herbal medicine, whether you're rolling in the clover or in the lab with the pipette. 
it's still herbal medicine. But the scientific tradition is more interested in that active principle. What is it that does that thing? Let me tell you what I think is a rather interesting story about this. An herbal friend of mine decided to go on a vacation to South America. One day, while he was planning his trip, he received a call from a pharmaceutical company. And they said to him, we hear you are planning to go to the Amazon. Yes, he said. Would you be willing to look for medicinal plants while you are there? Hmm. He thinks to himself, well, of course, you know, what do herbalists do on vacation but look at and for interesting plants? Well, yes, he says, I would be willing to do that. And how do you want me to look for these medicinal plants? Do you want me to interview the medicine people? They said, no, 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 we're going to give you a, a test kit for alkaline, anything that tests alkaline, just, you know, test various plants, anything that tests alkaline, just bring a big enough sample home for us to work with it. Now, alkaline t- testing plants contain alkaloids, which are alkaline principles in plants, which are a kind of poison found in plants. These poisons don't kill you necessarily dead. As a matter of fact, we're pretty tolerant of alkaloids. Caffeine is an alkaloid, and as we know, it doesn't kill us, found in quite a few plants. So we have kind of grown up with the alkaloids in the plants, and yet when we extract them, concentrate them, and purify them, then we can actually create a drug. So you can't drink enough coffee to kill yourself. But you can synthesize caffeine, the active ingredient in the coffee, an alkaloid. And you can take 10 grams, which is a third of an ounce of caffeine, and it will kill you. So we begin to see that thinking of healing in scientific terms means that we are going to look for causes, causing the symptoms, and we are going to want to look very narrowly and very carefully, and then we are going to want to choose a poison to interact and change what's going on. That poison, of course, is called a drug. Don't think for a moment there's any drug that is not a poison. In fact, to sell a drug in the United States and through most of the world, you must establish an LD50. And an LD50 simply means that it is the lethal dose we kill 50% of So when you've established an LD50, in other words, when you've given a group of animals enough of that half of them die, then you can legally sell your drug. So yes, all drugs are poisons. All drugs given in great enough quantity can cause grievous and serious harm. As I said last week, we are all more and more aware of this, and yet, nonetheless, we still have millions upon millions of Americans who do indeed take drugs on a daily basis. Many are being told that these drugs are there to make them healthy, drugs to lower the blood pressure, drugs to lower cholesterol, drugs to interact with blood sugar, drugs to interact with serotonin and other brain chemicals. These are not drugs that are used by small and insignificant numbers of Americans. They are drugs that are used by millions of Americans, drugs that that change something of our bones, drugs that change how pain travels in our body, drugs that change how acid, which begins the digestion process, is dealt with in our body. These drugs have much greater 
dangers associated with them than most of us are aware of. The idea that taking a poison to stay healthy would be good is going to be viewed by coming generations much the way we view people wearing during the plague years a bird's beak with garlic inside it to ward off the plague. It will be seen as kind of silly. How could they ever have thought that exposing their breasts to radiation during a mammary web would in any way help to do anything other than cause breast cancer? Certainly not prevent it. The scientific tradition tends to focus very much on using drugs and using high-tech medicine. Concentrating, certainly going to plants and going to nature, but in looking at plants and in looking at nature, focusing in on the active ingredient. It can be difficult to tell what the active ingredient is. There's a plant commonly known as St. John's. I call it St. Joan's wort because it's a great plant to help prevent burns and I figure that Joan knows a whole lot more about burning than John does. So, you're sure that you've heard about St. John's, St. Joan's wort. Maybe you haven't heard that there's a lot of discussion about what the active ingredient might be because there are a lot of different active ingredients in this plant. The botanical name is Hypericum perforatum. And one of the active ingredients is hypericin. Another one is pseudo hypericin. And then there's hyperfluorin. These are just three out of dozens of active ingredients found in this one plant. Now, one way to make herbal medicine a little more drug like without actually turning it into a drug is to take your plant and to extract the active ingredient from it and then to add it back to the plant in a measured amount. Remember the scientific tradition likes to measure. So you can buy ginkgo with X percentage of Ginkgo lides, the active ingredient. You can buy valerian with X percentage of valerianic acid, the active ingredient, and so on down the line. Now, I want you to know that there's not an herbalist that I know of in America today who will touch an herbal medicine made with active ingredients. They're called standardized tinctures, because as you see, that's what they are. They are standardized, but a standardized tincture of Hypericum perforatum, St. Jones wort in Germany, is standardized to a certain amount of hyperfluorin, whereas in the United States, it is standardized to a certain amount of hypericin, and at the same time, pseudo-hypericin as an extracted, purified, concentrated chemical constituent from this plant went to human drug studies because it kills HIV but also causes intense sun sensitivity. And so as a drug cannot be used. Now, herbalists will tell you, and I certainly want them, that it is this complexity in the plants. It is the fact that they don't have just one active ingredient, but a whole symphony of active ingredients that makes herbal medicine, dare I say it, superior to drug medicine, certainly. I am not saying that there aren't times to take drugs. I had a grandfather who was a diabetic before the days of insulin, and he died in a horrible way, and it took a long time for them to cut him down piece by piece until he finally left. So I am all for drugs. I certainly don't want to turn back the clock or see the end of the world and see the end of our ability to have these things. I simply think, as do many people, that they are 
widely overused and that we should at least, for the most part, be trying herbs and herbal medicines before we try drugs, especially for many of the so-called preventative tasks that these drugs are being told to stand in for. You know, at one point, someone published in the United States in a medical journal the idea, and I still see this idea raise its little snout now and then, of a poly pill. And you would have a poly pill for each decade of life. So that for a woman, her poly pill in her 20s, 30s, and 40s would contain birth control hormones. And then as she aged, when she got into her 50s, her poly pill would contain estrogen and hormone replacement. Of course, these pills would have blood pressure-lowering drugs, cholesterol-lowering drugs, mood-altering drugs, and so on. And they would be tailored to the decades of your life. Well, a group of British physicians, upon reading this, and being quite horrified by it, I actually sat down and made a little list of things that you could eat on a daily basis that would be the same as taking this poly pill. In other words, it would give you the blood pressure lowering um, activity, the cholesterol lowering activity, the immune system strengthening activity, and the hormone stabilizing activity. I bet you're wondering what those foods are, or maybe you already know. It starts out with three ounces of dark chocolate. Okay, this is not going to be a bad idea, is it? And then you have your choice of a glass of wine or a cup of green tea, and it continues on. So herbal medicine, new catch word. I'm sure you're hearing is functional foods. We can think of herbal medicine as functional foods. These are plants that have a lot they can do for us. They're not drugs. The straight line is the scientific tradition. The straight line is static. It separates. It's stable. It defines. It makes a mark. It's a boundary. It slashes and cuts. The straight line is the sword. It has two opposite and opposing ends. Straight line, linear thought, linear time, inherently static, must be energized by opposition and conflict, life against death, good against bad, white against black, light against darkness. In the scientific tradition, you better fight to stay alive. Death tries to distinguish you at every opportunity. Death is the enemy and you must fight death and disease. There is a struggle to survive in the scientific tradition. The scientific tradition is about fixity. But life is not about fixity. What is about fixity? Machines are about fixity That's where the scientific tradition works so well. You know, when I get on an airplane, I sure hope the scientific tradition is in force, right? I want the person who's piloting that airplane, when they look at the altimeter to see how high that we are, I want them to be able to read that height right out and understand it and not to get green jelly beans. Yes. There is a time for measuring. There is a time for repetition. There is a time for fixity. And machines, and when we are interacting with machines, is when we want that. And so the scientific tradition tends to see the body as a machine. And healers now are replaced by mechanics. Remedies are chosen based on repeatability and their ability to restore normalcy, not because they enhance life or strengthen health. This reductionistic approach means that we are going to fight that enemy, whether it is the flu or cancer, and if there is some collateral damage, we will deal with that later. I'm thinking of a movie called Patch. It's about my friend Patch Adams. And there's a scene in the movie where Patch is in training to be a doctor. He's an intern, and he is following a doctor through the corridors of a hospital with a bunch of other interns. They're on rounds, 
And there's a woman laying on a gurney in the hall of the hospital. And the lead doctor stops and looks at her and begins talking about her. The camera angle is such that we see the backs of the intern's head who are facing the MD who is standing facing us and facing in the same direction as the woman's face lying on the gurney so he can't see her face. He can only see the faces of the interns, but we can see her face. But he begins to lecture the interns about this diabetic foot. And he pulls back the covers and he begins to talk about, we are going to do this for this diabetic foot and we are going to do this for this diabetic foot. And if that doesn't work, we are going to amputate this diabetic foot. And first, you see the woman's face. And she's rather pleased that she's getting some attention. You know how it is, laying in a gurney in the hall in the hospital. You don't feel like you're very important. And here, a whole crowd of people have stopped to pay attention to her. Hey, that's pretty good. So she's kind of, you know, up and smiling. And as he begins to talk about the diabetic foot, you can tell that she's a little like, oh, well, how you know, don't I exist? And then as he comes to the finale of cutting off this diabetic foot, you can see the abject horror on her face. And uh, the MD at the end of the spiel looks at the interns and asks that question that all teachers are trained to ask when they want utter and complete silence. Are there any questions? And Patch says, what's her name? There are things that we can do when we use medicine as a way to cut and enter, to break normal boundaries and to fix things. Certainly, cutting off a gangrene foot is one of the things that we can do. But it's not necessary to turn the body into a machine in order to do it. We can still ask her what her name is. I was at a conference where both Patch Adams and I were teaching, and I was standing talking with Patch when someone came up to him and joined the conversation, and at one point said to him, well, how does it feel to not be practicing as a doctor? And Patch looked at him and said, making people laugh is doctoring too. Do you know? The scientific tradition wants to fix the broken machine. Wow. What happens when we move into the scientific tradition? Well, we will be measured, and we will all feel that return to childhood that makes us say, am I measuring up? Will it be okay? In fact, I find from many people that they don't ever want to go to a doctor because they're afraid they won't measure up. And if you don't measure up, and good likelihood that you won't measure up, then you will be written a prescription for drugs to make you measure up. I would like to read some quotes from books in the scientific tradition. This is in their own words. It is not herbal medicine, but botanical therapeutics. Herbal teas should be viewed as dilute sources of drugs. Herbs are merely crude drugs of vegetable origin selected and utilized by laypersons for the treatment of disease or in the maintaining of health. The only way to gain a real understanding of herbs or their uses is through the scientific method of understanding their constituents. All other methods lead to delusion. The hazards associated with herbal medications are quite different. Lack of definite knowledge regarding the constituents and pharmacology of herbs renders their use imprecise at best, dangerous at worst, 
prominent experts so will speak on biochemical pharmacology of alkaloids and the production and ecology of secondary plant products. When I saw her vomiting violently, I realized that the plant had enormous potential as a medicinal drug. The herbs of which you speak belong in a lab with qualified professionals, not in a teapot, in, in someone's home. The risks of injury from herbal medications is much too great to warrant experimentation in this relatively unexplored field. A scientific body of experimentally based and rationally arranged knowledge has nothing in common with traditional lore-based or symbolic connections. Herbal teas have no therapeutic value that cannot be more safely and effectively obtained from a specifically targeted modern drug. It is, you know, impossible to distinguish between drugs and poisons. Drugs given in excess will cause death, and poisons are valuable remedies in small doses, as all herbs should be viewed with alarm. It is essential that the amount of the active principle given in any dose be uniform and of known potency. The New England Journal of Medicine reports that in 1981, 36% of hospital admissions were caused by previous medical treatment. Ten years ago, the American Journal of Medicine ran a study showing that the greatest cause of death in America is reactions to properly prescribed drugs properly taken and to hospitalization, in other words, co-infections that are created in hospitals. The rate of correct diagnosis in American hospitals has been falling steadily with a 20% drop in correct diagnoses between 1960 and 1980 and further drops to the present day. The scientific tradition wants the whole playing field to itself. It enacts laws to make other forms of healing illegal. It ignites fear campaigns to make people think that other forms of healing could somehow hurt them. In fact, the predominant emotion of the scientific tradition is fear. The symbol of the scientific tradition is the line. The overall vision is one of homeostasis. Disease is the enemy. We must fix or fight the disease. The body is a machine. The healer is a mechanic. The troubled one said, it is beyond me. I need an expert to take care. And the expert says, I will trust the test results. Drugs and surgery are preferred treatments. And the vision of perfect health is a young, fully functioning white man. Health care becomes elitist and world view becomes reductionistic. The whole is seen as exactly the same as its parts. Women are seen as un stable, and thus all things having to do with women, including menstruation, menopause, birth, and lactation are suspect and need to be fixed and measured. Favorite plants of scientific tradition are plants that have active ingredients, and the ideal remedy is something that is precise, odorless, and tasteless. Why wouldn't an herbalist want to use an herb that is standardized because we are herbalists, because we don't want to use drugs? A drug is a single purified 
molecule that has a direction of action. If I give you a drug to lower your blood pressure, by golly, by gosh, that drug is going to lower your blood pressure. Well, it may not, but it's certainly not going to make your blood pressure go up. Whereas, if you have high blood pressure and you take motherwort, by golly, you could lower your blood pressure. But if you have low blood pressure and you take motherwort, golly gosh, that could raise your blood pressure. Huh? What's going on? It's back to those groups, those symphonies of active ingredients that occur in the whole plant, which allows our bodies to select from those symphonies, just as when you're listening to a real symphony, you can't literally hear all the instruments play at once. You say, oh, I'm going to listen to the violins, or oh, I like what the flute or do is doing, or is that the timpani back there? What is going on with the oboe? And the ear, as it were, like the eye travels from place to place, focusing in on something so that we get the sensation of the wholeness in just that way the body can with the hundreds of different constituents in each plant focus in on the constituent that gives it exactly what it needs. Now let me mention to you that my definition of a drug is something that does not grow out of the ground and cannot be made in your kitchen. So a plant like, say, marijuana is not a drug because it grows out of the ground. And a tincture that you can make in your own kitchen or even your own bedroom if you so choose is also not a drug. But something like a supplement that you would buy at a health food store is a drug. And that's because it even if it says it's plant-based, has synthetic things in it that were made in the laboratory, not your kitchen, and not growing out of the ground. And things that are purified, isolated, and concentrated, well, that's those are the three actions that we can put any plant through to come up with a drug. So when we isolate, concentrate, and purify essential oils from plants, then we must recognize that those essential oils are also drugs. So it's not just the scientific tradition that uses drugs, as we will see. The heroic tradition and alternative medicine also likes to use what I call soft drugs. The scientific tradition can be a good choice if you feel safest knowing exactly what will happen and if you have the idea that control is the best possible thing. If that isn't your choice, then you still have two other possibilities, the heroic tradition and the wise woman tradition. I'll be returning in upcoming weeks to share with you more about these two traditions. Next week, we'll focus on the heroic tradition and see how poking, puking, and purging ever came to be considered healing. And in our last session, two weeks from now, we will move into the spiraling abundance of the wise woman tradition. This is Susan Weed sending you dream blessings and thanking you for opening your hearts and your minds to me and to the wise woman tradition. Thank you, Susan. This completes the second segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. 